Hello. Thanks so much for joining me on the Damn Right Podcast. To set up our guest today, I want to first set the stage with two important items. I founded AVP back in 2006. Actually, April 21st was our 18th year anniversary, so happy birthday to AVP. Anyhow, over the past 18 years, I've had the privilege of working across a number of verticals. Anyone who has worked in a number of places within their career will know that one of the big and important parts of onboarding and becoming a productive part of a new company is learning and using the terminology. Each organization has its unique terms and the distinct way that they use those terms. So you'll understand when I say that the thing that has differed the most in working across verticals has been the terminology. Our corporate clients talk about DAM. Our libraries and archives clients talk about digital preservation. Our government clients talk about digital collection management and so on. In truth, there is a great deal of overlap in the skills and expertise necessary to effectively tackle any of these domains. Of course, there is nuance that is important and distinct, which is mostly about understanding purpose, mission, context, and history. This is akin to learning the terminology of a given workplace and coming to understand the things that make each workplace unique. Like anywhere, the use of a terminology is a signal to people about which tribe you are part of. Just as words have meaning, how you use those words has meaning. For years, this reality has caused a great deal of consternation for us at AVP. Why? Because we have always worked with an array of customers, we have always had to make sure to be careful and precise in our use of terminology. With an individual customer, this is easy. With a website, this is very difficult. On a website, you have to choose the terms that will resonate with your target audience and have them know that when they land on their page, they are with their people. We didn't want people who talk about Dan to see us talking about collection management and vice versa, thinking that they were not with their people. But in wanting to avoid offending anyone, we failed to talk effectively to everyone. In 2021, we decided to go all in on the term digital asset management and to make sure that we communicated to everyone that our definition of digital asset management was inclusive of digital collection management and digital preservation and was not a term that was intended to exclude our clients and friends in sectors that didn't use this term. Since then, I've been relieved to find that one, we've offended very few of them, and two, these verticals have also started to embrace the term digital asset management themselves. Even more, these verticals have started to embrace technologies that use the DAM label. And conversely, technologies that use the DAM label have started to represent the interests and needs of people who consider themselves to practice digital collection management and digital preservation. I say all this as a backdrop because the focus of today's episode is on an archive of video Holocaust testimonies. It almost feels wrong to refer to these testimonies as digital assets. But even though my guest does not use any technology that refers to itself as a dam, the practices and skills that are used are digital asset management practices and skills. A common refrain for digital assets is that they are not digital assets until you have the rights and the metadata to be able to find them use them, and derive value from them. Historically, in the distinctions that have existed between the use of the terms digital asset management and digital collection management, one of them is the definition of value. In DAM conferences 20 years ago, if you talked about digital assets and value, you could be certain that 90% or more of the people in the room were thinking dollar signs. And if you were at an archive conference and you talked about digital collection management and value, you could be certain that 90% or more of the people in the room were thinking of cultural and historical value. And while I think this is becoming less true over time, it feels important to say that in this podcast episode and in the podcast in general, when we talk about digital assets and their value, that we mean any and all of the above. It is very true to say that a file without rights and metadata has no value of any sort, financially, culturally, historically, or otherwise. If you cannot find it, if you cannot use it, it has no value. So in this episode, I want to ensure our listeners that there was a great deal of meaning and relevancy in calling these Holocaust testimonies digital assets. They are truly assets that have a great deal of value in the most holistic and meaningful of ways. Having said that, and with the Holocaust Remembrance Day coming up on May 6th, I'm privileged to have the director of Yale's Fortune Off Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, Stephen Naren, with me today. Prior to becoming the director, Stephen was an employee at the Fortune Off Archive, where he worked extensively on this collection of materials and helped guide it into the digital age. 
Since becoming the director of the Fortune Off Archive, Stephen has been prolific and innovative in his work to make these testimonies available to the public and to proactively use the materials in the archive to create compelling experiences for people to discover and engage with these testimonies. This has included collaborating on the development of a software platform, launching a podcast, releasing an album, running a fellowship program, and running both a speaker and a film series. And that's not even all of it. I'm so thrilled to have Stephen Aaron on the Damn Right podcast with me today and to introduce him to the Damn Right audience. Remember, damn right, because it's too important to get wrong. Stephen Aaron, welcome to the Damn Right podcast. I'm super excited to have you today. Uh, very glad to be talking with you about uh, all kinds of topics around Damn and this amazing collection and archive that you're the director of. Uh, thank you for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Chris. Thanks. So I wonder if we could start with you just giving us a background about your background, your history, and kind of how you came to be where you are today. Okay, well, I've I've been working with this particular collection, Yale's Fortune Off Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, on and off now since 2003. Um, so it really was my, my first professional job as a, a librarian and archivist, but... Um, but obviously, I, I've 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 always had a, a deep interest in in Jewish history and Jewish culture and Jewish languages, and then and I studied um, I studied abroad, um, and learned Hebrew and Yiddish and German. And um, while I was in Germany as a graduate student, I um, was lucky enough to get a position in an archive uh, at the Centrum Judaicum as a as a student worker. Uh, and it was the Das uh, Gesamtarchiv der Deutschen Juden. This is a, 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 a sort of um, general archive for all of the Jewish communities in Germany. And I worked with that collection for for over a year as a as a student worker. And that's when I really was bitten with this sort of um, bug, this interest in archives in general. Um, and so that's when I decided to sort of turn towards the the, the field of archives and and. And, and libraries and when got my degree um, focused on archives in UT uh, in Austin, which was a great program. I learned a lot. Um, and then uh, right out of law, uh, of library school, I, I, I found the position at the, the Fortune of Video Archive. And so it really was the first professional experience I had. And I, I just loved working with this collection. Uh, it's a collection that's exclusively uh, audio visual testimonies of Holocaust survivors and witnesses of 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 the Holocaust, and um, yeah, so that's that's a little bit about my my academic background and how I became interested in working, in particular with audiovisual collections. Wow! So you've been at the at the archive for quite a while now. When did you? When was that that you started there? So two thousand three. I worked as an archivist for about five years, and then I um, I moved to Europe with my uh, my wife, and we were in Sweden. I worked as a librarian in Sweden for a number of years and then came back in 2015 to take on the role as director. Uh, worked very closely with with some of the founders of the collection as well as um, uh, the uh, longstanding archivist and director, uh, Joanne Rudolph, who, 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 worked at, who worked at the Fortune of the Archives from 1984 uh, really led the collection for decades, and so I had a, a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity to mentor, to have her as a mentor, and um, and learn really from from the from the individuals who helped build the collection over the last forty five years. And has the archive always been under the the auspices of Yale University, or did it start independent from Yale? Well, that's one of the in, the most interesting things about this collection is that it it actually started in New Haven as a grassroots effort of volunteers um, and uh, children of survivors, survivors, um, sort of fellow travelers who, um, who who formed a, a nonprofit organization in New Haven to record testimonies of. Uh, of Holocaust survivors and witnesses. So it didn't come, that was in 1979. So the first tapings were in May of 1979. And it, and it really was very much um, an effort from the ground up. Uh, survivors were, um, were in the leadership of the organization, the nonprofit. President of the, the, the nonprofit was a man named William Rosenberg, who was a survivor from Częstochowa, Poland. Uh, survivors would hold 
meetings in their homes to organize the tapings. They'd fund the the rental of the of the what was at the time quite expensive video equipment to to do this professional broadcast, professional standard recordings. Um, and of course, it, inter- survivors served as interviewers and as interviewees, so they were on both sides of of the camera. And so that's in in the early days. Uh, 79 starts. And then um, one of the first survivors who was recorded in 1979 uh, was Renee Hartman, uh, who was born in Bratislava. And Renee happened to be married to uh, a professor at Yale, Jeffrey Hartman, who was a professor of comparative literature. And so Jeffrey became involved in this, this sort of local project, community project, uh, very early on. He, he, as an academic, knew how to write grants. Um, and so he wrote he wrote a number of successful grants to help increase the funding of the project. And he was then really responsible for bringing the collection and giving it a permanent home at Yale. And so it was deposited at Yale in 1981, and it opened its doors to the public in 1982. Uh, and at that time, I, there were about 183 testimonies that had been recorded by the, the, the Video Archive's predecessor organization. This, this, this organization was called the Holocaust Survivors Film Project. So um, this project then became the video archive for Holocaust testimonies. And um, and it and there were about 183 testimonies at the time, and it's now grown to over 4,300 testimonies. Wow. Uh, it's 10,000, more than 10,000 hours of recorded material. Uh, it was recorded in, in, in North America, South America, uh, across Europe, in Israel. Um, in over 20 different languages and you know over a dozen different countries with the help of what we call affiliated projects uh, which are independent projects that that form a collaborative um, f- agreement with 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 the fortune of video archive and so it has just grown exponentially and um, ever since we've been since 82 we've we've been serving the research community uh, they come to Yale they use the collection there um, hundreds of researchers every year, uh, and then in 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 about 2016, we we began making the collection available digitally uh, at access sites. And so these access sites are all over the world. Um, there are t- over 200 of them, uh, and usually institutions of higher learning or, or research institutes. So um, the collection has been uh, uh, not only had has it um, did it grow from a small grassroots effort into a into a sort of a global um, a global documentation project, but it's now um, readily accessible all over the world. You've hinted at at, at several things that I just want to kind of put on the table so listeners understand. But the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies is um, all video recordings. Is that right? Yeah, right. It's exclusively video recordings. Um, and in fact, it was this this HSFP, the Holocaust Survivors Film Project, was the first project of its kind to begin recording video interviews with survivors on any sort of extended basis. So we really are the first first sustained project um, of its kind. And and by sustained, I mean really sustained. We've we recorded our our most recent interview in 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 2023. So right. we're talking about over 40, almost 45 years of of documentation, and. Um, and so that's a that provides a, a quite a, a unique longitudinal perspective of of this whole genre of of Holocaust testimony. There have been lots of many there have been many other projects that followed in our in our wake, and um, but but most of them rise and fall fairly quickly. This is this is a project that's really um, withstood the sort of test of time. And um, and another thing that's quite incredible about this 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 sort of um, this this lifespan is that um, many of the interviewers who've been volunteers the entire time, volunteer interviewers uh, who were recording in the 1980s are still recording with us today. So when we when we when we get a call from a survivor who wants to give testimony and who hasn't given testimony before, um, we pull in some of the most experienced interviewers uh, there are who 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 have done this type of work. You mentioned that these were originally recorded. Uh, many of them, you're still recording them, so you're not recording them on analog videotape today. But originally, they were recorded on what was considered broadcast quality analog videotape. Um, 
you talked about there being a digitization process uh, of, of everything in your collection, I believe at some point along the way. Um, could you just tell us about like, what are some of the other, I, I assume there's transcripts and, and, and other aspects. Can you tell us a little bit about just what is the collection look like um, and kind of what are some of the salient steps that you've taken to make it uh, usable, preservable, accessible? There is a story there um, because this archive is so ha has had such a long history. It's gone through, and it's from the very beginning that uh, been um, uh, been an archive that is, let's say, um, I, I don't want to say groundbreaking, but certainly forward thinking in its use of technology uh, from the very beginning. I mean, just the the embrace of 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 broadcast video alone was a sort of at the time a revolutionary step. Um, but beyond that, uh, you know, the Fortune Off Video Archive has always uh, been sort of a step ahead, in, at least in, in, in the larger library system at Yale, um, in thinking about how to make the collection accessible, um, embracing digital tools, cataloging through, you know, Arlen and, and other sort of central, central online searchable databases. Uh, we were one of the first collections on campus, if not the first collection on campus, to have its own website. Um, you know, so we we've always been we've always embraced technology, um, at least at least for the for the the benefits that it can can bring in terms of making this collection more accessible and more available to the research community. Um, but uh, um, you know, like as far as what other what other content or whether what other layers of of information that that we've had to we've had to sort of transform from an analog to a digital world. Yeah, we've had the videos themselves, and that took that took over five years. Um, where we had a, this, an incredible um, video engineer named Frank Clifford, who used to work at Yale Broadcast, who then came over to the Fortune of Video Archive and by hand um, using you know Sama solos and and uh, a fleet of Umatic and Betacam decks uh, digitized all you know ten thousand plus hours of video in, in real time, day after day after day for years. Um, sadly, he's he passed away, um, but really he he did in just an in incredible work. And you know, as you know, as someone who's worked hands on with with analog legacy video, um, you know, he kept those machines running by by all means necessary. Yeah. And and you know, sometimes he'd only have one pass with shedding tape that was from 1979 or 1980, and, and you know, he'd be holding down the heads and, and in order to get a good a good um, transfer. Yeah. And so that's just one um, one step, right? But then we have all these analog indexes that were uh, were handwritten, handwritten notes that describe the, the content of each interview that then became um, typed indexes. And those indexes were in, you know, WordPerfect and various versions of Word and OpenOffice. And, and so we have this whole, uh, this whole other, um, effort of, of standardizing um, and uh, migrating the indexes from, from one format to another. Yeah. Uh, we, eventually, we eventually moved everything into ohms. So now all those indexes have been ohms and we've connected, of course, the ohms indexes with the, with the video. And so that was, a, that was a huge effort. Let me stop you just for a second, because I think there, there's probably many people that don't, un, don't know what indexes are, or, or at least how you define them and, and ohms. So maybe let's just drill down a little bit on that. What's an index? Yeah. What's it look like? How's it work? And what is ohms? Okay. So the indexes are a little idiosyncratic for us, right? So we, we call them indexes. We used to call them finding aids, which is a lot more in tune with the kind of archival world, but they weren't really finding aids per se either, although they did allow us to find things. Um, what they were are detailed notes in the first person in English, regardless of what the language of the testimony is. Uh, so first person notes written by students who, who, who had the native language of the testimony they were watching. And they're very, very summarized. So they read kind of like transcripts, but they aren't transcripts. They're not word for word. Um, the goal was to capture the most salient details of the testimony in as terse a form as possible. And um, every five minutes, the student would put a time code from the video, a visible time code, so that uh, researchers could then use these, these indexes or notes or finding aids to find specific speech events in the testimony. Uh, you know, this was, this was um, long before you had like SRT and, and WebVTT kind of transcripts, right? 
you'd use this paper. So they'd get this paper index, they'd take it with them, they'd have the video, VHS use copy, sitting in ma manuscripts and archives in Sterling Memorial Library, and they'd be looking through the notes and, and trying to find uh, the section of the testimony that was most relevant for their research. And so those notes exist, those indexes, those notes, those finding aids, they exist in a number of different forms. And, um, and even more uh, um, confounding, the notes, the indexes were created from the use copies and the use copies had visible time code and that visible time code did not refer, was not the same time code as the original master tapes because the VHS use copies, of course, don't start and stop at the same time as the master tapes. So there was this discrepancy between the, the time code on the notes and the time code on the, <laughs> on the master tapes. So we couldn't use the indexes properly with the, with the digital um, master videos. So that's why um, we, we sort of came up and there was no like programmatic way to just mathematically transform the, the index timing to the, to the master tape timing. So that's when we found ohms. Um, and we saw that OHMS was just a, a sort of ideal system where you could synchronize, and it, it OHMS stands for Oral History Metadata Synchronizer. And you could use OHMS, it was a free tool that you can use, it is a free tool that you can use to, to, um, to synchronize text-based text data, so indexes, finding aids, transcripts with, with the digital audio or video. And so we did that with the entire collection, which also took us years but but now we have you know now we have all the indexes are are, are searchable and full text searches in in aviary and and which allows researchers enormous amount enormous amount of flexibility in, in terms of locating specific topics and events in, within a, a testimony or across all the testimonies and you created indexes which were not transcripts <clears throat> because was that because of the amount of time it took? Was that because that's what current best practice was? Why why did you take that route instead of transcripts at the time? That's also a really good question. Um, well, actually, there there's a pra there's a practical side. It simply was too time consuming and expensive to create full transcripts. Uh, and this is a this is a collection that really grew uh, very slowly and um, has had limited resources its entire existence. So we had to be cautious about where we, we, we sort of put our resources. And so the indexes, these indexes seemed like the, the, the quickest, most cost-effective way to gain intellectual access to the collection. And the archivists used these indexes then to create catalog records, regular old Mark catalog records, almost like every testimony was cataloged, almost like a book. And, um, and you could then search across those catalog records. But beyond the practical, side. Um, there was also a, an ethical and um, I think intellectual reason not to go the path of transcripts. Um, one was that no transcript, no, 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 no transcript, no textual transcript can truly capture uh, the richness of an audio visual document. You cannot mm. capture gestures, you cannot capture um, tone, you cannot capture pauses that are very meaningful in a, in a, in a recording, like a video testimony of a survivor, mm. um, the look in the eyes. I mean, these are things that cannot adequately be captured in a, in a transcript. And so the thought was, if you can't make an accurate transcript, we have to be, we have to, we have to really push the, um, the viewer to watch the recording. And again, that's also part of the the ethos of the archive is that we want you to watch. Mm. We want you to witness the witness, right? We want you to be a part, you, we want you to be present, entirely present. And if you provide transcripts uh, to researchers, as we all know, um, the researchers will go straight to the transcripts and use the transcripts and might not even watch the video. Mm. Uh, and that's, you know, some researchers are, are lazy like that, but we, we felt that that was an ethical ethically unsound um, use of video testimony. Yeah. Uh, and so we really want to, we, we sort of pressure, let's say, or you know, coerce uh, the researcher to watch the video and to watch the video in its entirety. Um, yeah. And I think that's an, that's an obligation. There, there's an ethical obligation there that, that needs to be followed. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you didn't want to mediate, it sounds like, between, you didn't want there to be a mediation between the, the person that was watching or using these materials and, and the original 
testimony. That's super interesting. It makes a lot of sense. Well, I mean, it also, it does make sense because, I mean, think about it. If you read, if you read a transcript um, and, it, and it's read by the, and it's spoken by the survivor with an ironic tone of voice, how are you supposed to understand that there's irony or sarcasm in, in a transcript? Right. Um, you have to, you have to listen um, and watch in order to truly grasp what's happening. Otherwise, you, uh, researchers will, will quite simply make mistakes. Yeah. It will misquote and, and misinterpret. So I, I sidetracked you there. You were kind of on a path t- talking about the various elements that you have in the archive. You were, you were talking about indexes and ohms when I stopped you. And, and, and was there, was there, were there other things that you wanted to, to talk about there? Well, there are a couple of other things that are interesting and we're still, we're still trying to figure out how to integrate them. Um, one is we conducted something called a pre-interview. All of the testimony. So the, the process of the process that we follow when we record testimonies is that um, there's contact with the survivor uh, a w- several weeks or you know a week before the interview, um, and the interviewers who are going to be at the session uh, call one of them at least calls the calls the witness and tells informs them about how it's going to work that it's a very open ended interview process that they're going to. They're going to introduce themselves at the beginning, and they're going to tell us their their you know start from their earliest childhood memories all the way up to the present. Uh, that there aren't set questions, um, but they then also ask them a series of of, of questions, of mostly you know, biographical questions. Where were you born? Um, when were you born? What did your parents do? Did you have any siblings? And so they gather all of this information prior to the actual interview, so that they can then go back. Um, go back to the library and do research about uh, about this person's life. So the town they're from, learning about the town they're from, learning about the camps and the ghettos that they might have been mm. in, um, you know, really diving into this person's life so that when they show up in the actual recording, uh, the interviewers are already well informed about this person's life. They know the names of the of of the siblings and the and the parents and what they did, and they don't have to ask these questions because they know it. And then they can just serve as um, sort of guides or assist uh, the witness as they really tell their life story in as open a, uh, a manner as possible. So, so those those pre-interview forms are really interesting. Um, also, because uh, the interview once they get into this, the recording studio, there's a lot of unknowns. So uh, sometimes the information that's on the 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 pre-interview doesn't make it into the interview because the interview has a kind of life of its own. Mm-hmm. Um, but we want to we, we need to find a way to to make those pre-interview forms more uh, the data in those pre-interview forms more accessible to the researchers because there's some interesting information there. Yeah. And then the other piece is the we're we're creating transcripts now. So as I mentioned, those indexes, those finding aids, they're always in English, no matter what the original language is, which can be really frustrating for. For researchers who 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 know these languages and then have to search um, in English, let's say, to find information in a Slovak testimony or a Hebrew testimony or a Yiddish testimony, so we're now in the process of of transcribing the entire collection uh, in the original languages, so that um, so that native speakers and uh, and researchers can can search across across testimonies in their language. Um, which is in a way a compromise um, and, a, and a move away from what I said earlier about, you know, we want to, if we provide transcripts, then the risk is that people will just use the transcripts and not to watch the video. But, but we felt this was a, a necessary step in, in this day and age to, to provide further intellectual access. Well, it also seems that there's been a major technological leap, whereas today I know the way that you uh, provide access to transcripts is synchronized with the testimony. So, I mean, that's a very different experience than maybe 15 years ago where someone would have just gotten a transcript and may have never watched the testimony, right? That seems like that's a very different experience and stays true to what you said about why it was important not to do that at the time. Yeah, absolutely. And also think about, we've also been um, approaching transcription with another, you know, another um, motivation. And that is that obviously people who are hearing impaired can't take advantage of uh, an audiovisual testimony in the same way that a hearing person is. So to be able to provide a transcript and, and subtitles uh, for, for testimonies is also really valuable. The other thing is even um, many of these testimonies are, are extremely, um, can be extremely 
difficult to understand uh, because of the survivors often are speaking in a, in a, in a language that isn't their native native tongue. And mm. so there's a lot of heavily accented um, uh, 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 testimonies. And so having transcripts and subtitles, transcripts as subtitles can be really valuable for everyone. Speaking of uh, the different, the technological leap, uh, some of the things you were talking about, writing indexes down on paper, pre-digitization was videotape. When did you do the digitization work again? What year or years? So I would say 2010 to 2015, but okay. I'd have to look it, I'd have to look it up. Okay. Um, so and we and we still, you know, even when when we launched Aviary, the vast majority of the digital the digitization work had been done by the time we we were able to launch Aviary and make it make the testimonies accessible um, at access sites. Two points about that. One is it sounds so archaic this day and age, right? Writing indexes down on paper and 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 I believe there's probably many modern practitioners that think that that sounds absurd, but Two points. One, that wasn't that long ago, and that was not unstandard. That that was pretty typical of what you'd find in in a lot of people that were managing collections, especially of analog materials. Um, two, um, just as an insight into you know your your one archive out of many archives in the world, and just to think about how many people haven't done what you've done, which is, uh, the digitization work, the transcription work, the, you know, you've, you've, as you said, you've embraced technology and that's not to, to put anybody down that hasn't, it's just to kind of get a, a moment, a glimpse into how many things that are out in the world that were created not that long ago. And for decades prior, uh, that, that still, uh, may be, uh, not accessible in some way. Yeah. And I mean, also like if you think about a traditional, you know, many traditional oral history, oral history projects, um, they would often record on, you know, tape or video and then create the transcript and then hand the transcript to the interviewee who would then, you know, sign that this, this, this transcript is an accurate depiction of my, my statement, right? And then they'd actually get rid of the original tapes because the transcript then becomes kind of the document. Wow. So, um, so yeah, that's that's um, we're very different. We've approached this very differently than a lot of oral history projects. Uh, and yeah, absolutely, we're really lucky that um, this collection, as I said, it you know it grew. It's still a very small in terms of human resources who who work with with this collection, but. Um, you know, we've been lucky to have, uh, have the longevity that we have and have the support from Yale University Library that really allows us to focus just exclusively on this collection, right? So from the very beginning, there has been this laser focus on making this as intellectually accessible and usable and standard, right? So we've used, you know, standard library and archival practice to make this collection accessible, using you know terminologies and taxonomies like Library of Congress subject headings and things like that that make it um, very easy to share our metadata with others to search across collections um, and so yeah we're I think we're we're we've been very we've been very lucky to to be a part of a research library from the very beginning mm. which 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 helped us to to go down that path um, of of description and description upon description upon description. Thanks for listening to the Damn Right Podcast. If you have ideas on topics you want to hear about, people you'd like to hear interviewed, or events that you'd like to see covered, drop us a line at damnright at weareavp.com and let us know. We would love your feedback. Speaking of feedback, please give us a rating on your platform of choice. And while you're at it, make sure that you don't miss an episode by following or subscribing. You can also stay up to date with me and the Damn Right Podcast by following me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in slash C Lucinic. And finally, go and find some really amazing and free resources from the best damn consultants in the business at weareavp.com slash free hyphen resources. You'll find things like our damn strategy canvas, damn health scorecard, and the get your damn budget slide deck template. Each resource has a free accompanying guide to help you put it to use. So go and get them now. And I guess you also have the benefit, although the the archive is is large in absolute terms and relative terms, it's it's fairly small. So that gives you an advantage to be able to really dive deep and and do a lot of great work around you know compared to an archive that might hun have hundreds of thousands of recordings or millions of recordings. Yeah, for sure.
the Fortunoff video archive for Holocaust testimonies is not the only archive of Holocaust testimonies in the country or in the world. Um, and each of those have had to make decisions about where, when, how to give access. And, and my understanding is that different decisions have been made about how to provide access to testimonies. Um, I wonder if you could just give us a sense of the, what's the landscape? You know, are there a few or are there dozens of archives of Holocaust testimonies? And, and help us understand what some of the, and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to say that anybody's right or wrong or anything like that, but just understand some of the considerations about that, that uh, these archives have had to navigate in thinking about how to provide access to Holocaust testimonies. There are many, many collections um, uh, all over the world. Uh, there are several large collections, which um, uh, sort of developed, uh, most of them developed in our uh, after us, after, after 19, we started 1979. So, um, and they do have indeed very different approaches to making the collections accessible. Uh, there's the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, for instance, which, you know, we have to remember that in 1979, when we started, there was no U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, the museum isn't, isn't really established until 1993. And, um, uh, prior to that, uh, there weren't a lot of other organizations doing this work in the United States or in North America. Um, but the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum is a national institution. It's a government-funded institution. And so the materials that they create, the testimonies that they've created and collected over the years, uh, they have been given a very broad um sort of broad permission to make those as accessible as possible. Uh, and um, I think that's, and that's in part because it's their, they see their mission as a sort of general, um, you know, education, uh, educational effort, right? The general public to educate the American people about the history of the Holocaust. In order to do that best, they have to make their sources as accessible as possible. That includes testimony. So their testimonies of which they have thousands um, are all digitized and accessible in their collection search online. So there really are no, no barriers at all to, um, to, the, to the, average, the average citizen researcher who wants to go in and watch as much unedited testimony as he or she desires. Um, so that's a very, very open model. Um, and I think it has a lot of, there's a lot of benefits to that. Um, uh, I do sometimes um, wonder how much the uh, of the general public is really interested in watching um, an unedited ten hour testimony of a Holocaust survivor. How much? How much of that they really? How many really do that? But for the average, for the research community, certainly uh, it's an enormous advantage. There are other institutions that, on a national level, like Yad Vashem in Israel. Yad Vashem has an enormous collection of testimonies, both that they've created themselves and that they've. Uh, they've collected over the years. Uh, they, some of those, many of those are available online, but uh, many, I would say the vast majority are only available to researchers who are then on site. So they have a slightly more restrictive, restrictive approach, but, but their aim has been to be, to collect ev as much of, of the source material as possible, um, either in original form or as, as digital copies. So they're a little bit more restrictive in a sense. Um, and then you have, uh, another major a major collection, the USC Shoah Foundation, uh, which was started by Steven Spielberg after the the um, the release of Schindler's List uh, in '94, and he in uh, his organization, the organization that grew out of this initial um, impulse, collected something like fifty thousand testimonies of survivors, but in a very short period of time. So I think about less than ten years, uh, and they. And they're now at USC, but they weren't at USC originally. They were on the Universal Studios back lot, I think. Mm -hmm. And so they had a very different approach to this work, almost, um, uh, you know, um, outside of the traditional world of academia and libraries. And um, and for a long time, their collection was only was only accessible through, and it still is for the most part, only accessible through subscription, the subscription model. 
Mm. And so they became, um, they have this, you know, this enormous, incredible collection, but it's only accessible to at universities and research centers that have the, have the resources to pay for that subscription fee. And so that's another, another model that is a little bit more restrictive. Um, at the same time, they have free tools for high schools and, 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 edu- and for educational use, something called eyewitness that has something like 3000 unedited testimonies that are openly available. Yeah. So they still provide um, thousands of, of complete unedited testimonies, but the vast majority of the collection is behind a, a, a paywall. And then you see you know, the fortune of video archives, which um, uh, has digitized its entire collection now. Um, uh, but for decades, uh, its collection was only accessible at, at, at Sterling Memorial Library in the Manuscripts and Archives Department in the reading room at Yale University. So you'd have to make the, the pilgrimage to New Haven to work with this material. And... Um, and so that's also, in a sense, very restrictive. Um, uh, only not everyone can can afford. Not all the researchers can afford to make the make the trip to New Haven to do that that type of work. So, um, but there's no costs in, involved with using the collection. So, in a sense, it's open to everyone. Uh, and that was that's how it, how it, how it worked at Yale. And so that was a bit restrictive. Um, but now it's a, now we've also opened up now. Now that the collection is digital at these and making it available at these access sites, I said you know I already said more than two hundred of them, but still, um, it's not like a, it's not like we've we've thrown it all up online like U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. It's still kind of like a, a closed fist that's kind of slowly opening, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and it's only accessible at these access sites. Uh, it's free, so the access sites don't have to pay a subscription fee, but they still have to sign a memorandum of agreement with us. It's only accessible on on IP ranges that are associated with those institutions, so at, at, at various universities and research centers. Um, so there is still a, a certain amount of of restriction on who can see it when and where. Yeah, and we have a different. We just have a very different um, a very different model, and that model of how to use a collection like this comes from, I think. Um, the fact that we were started by survivors themselves and, and children of survivors. This, this, this organization from the very beginning was very concerned about um, concerned about the well-being of, of the survivors before, during, and after the interview has been, has been given. Um, all of the witnesses sign release forms, and in these release forms, uh, it clearly states that Yale University owns copyright to the recording. We, we we can do theoretically legally whatever we'd like, but that doesn't mean we should. Um, and and there was always a sense that um, the survivors, as, although they quite clearly wanted to share their story with us and in, in, in a very public manner by giving testimony, um, they still deserve some modicum of privacy and 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 anonymity. Um, and so we've 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 been fairly restrictive in terms of not making it widely accessible online. Um, I mean, the release forms state we could broadcast them, et cetera. But could survivors in 1981 really imagine something like the the internet, where you could it's basically broadcast their entire unedited testimony with no obstacles, 24 hours a day to any place in the world? I mean, that's what the internet is. And and that feels like a step, a step too far, mm. um, without any without any kind of a mediation mm. for us. You also talked about um, two hundred access sites. Could you tell us what are those? Who are they? How do they work? What what is that? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I I did want to say actually something else about um, some of the ways in which we the archives places certain restrictions on access that might seem a little strange or idiosyncratic. Um, uh, another example uh, that I forgot to mention was, yeah, so things are slightly locked down in, in the sense that they're only available at access site. But, but another thing that's really unusual about this collection is we, we also truncate the last names of the survivors. Hmm. 
So if you were to search the metadata uh, in our, in a, if you were to go to Aviary and search, um, you would see very quickly that the testimonies are, uh, the titles of the testimonies are, you know, Stephen N. Holocaust testimony, Chris L. Holocaust testimony. Uh, the last names are, are, are hidden from view. Uh, and obviously once you, you're at an access site and you're watching the testimony and, and the person introduces themselves, you hear their name, you hear their last name. And in the transcript, if they say their last name, it's transcribed there, but you don't see the transcript unless you're at an access site either. Um, and the reason behind this was uh, in the early days, uh, one of the survivors' full name appeared in a documentary film that was screened on television. And uh, the survivor received threatening phone calls after the the, the film was, was screened. And um, after that, they decided that this was a risk that was they were unwilling to take and and push to to truncate the last names in order to protect um, the survivors' anonymity. Right. Um, of course, it's if you do research, it's not foolproof. If you make the effort to come and do the research, you can find out all this information, personal information. But um, the idea was to provide some basic hurdle that, of that would provide some protection. And as you can imagine, that's that's served its purpose well, but it also is an, it complicates the research process for, for the research community. If you're, if you're a researcher and you're looking for a very specific person who you know gave testimony, it's much harder to locate them. You can't just search for their last name and, and find them. Um, so that's an example of, of things that might seem sort of counterintuitive. We did this, though, to protect the survivors, and so what we saw was our, our first um, ethical obligation. And then we have the obligation to the research community, which comes second. And that's also a little bit unusual for an organization such as ours. Um, but you, you had a question about, um, beyond, uh, beyond this sort of access, what, what the access sites were or how they worked. Um, so the access sites are mostly universities and research institutions. So Holocaust museums, uh, uh, all over, um, all over the world, South America, North America, Israel, Europe. Um, we even have a, we have an open access site in Japan. Um, and, uh, the access sites sign a memorandum of agreement that clearly states what they will and what they can and cannot do with the collection. Uh, they provide us with their IP ranges. So we restrict, uh, we restrict the entire, the collection to an IP whitelist of all of the IP ranges at these institutions. So, either have to be on campus to, to watch the testimonies, or you have to use a VPN that you only, you know, students and faculty will have. Uh, everyone has to register in our, in aviary, our access and discovery system. Uh, and that was one of the, when we, when we helped develop this aviary, um, we, that was one of our major, um, requirements was that we would have some ability to control who sees what, when, where, and how, right. And so we, we we force everyone to 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 register in 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 our collection and ask for permission to view testimonies before they're they're given sort of free free access to everything and and so it's a very protective model um, and in in some ways it seems uh, seems to I would guess be in tension with the way a lot of other libraries and archives work where you you, you want to have the anonymity of the of the user is just as important as the the materials that they're using. But because we have this such sensitive materials in this collection, we felt we needed needed some extra level of control and protection relative to what you described earlier. Folks had to come to New Haven. I mean, it's it's hugely opened things up. That, that's been a major uh, transformation in that regard. It sounds like among the users, you have proactively been a big user. You've been extraordinarily prolific. I mean, you've talked about not just in the creation of uh, co-creating of Aviary, but uh, you've also created a podcast, I, I believe, from the collections. Uh, you've done an album, uh, which you pressed on vinyl, which was not from the testimonies, but was related to the testimonies. Uh, you have these fellowship programs, you do speaker series, you do film series, you do all sorts of stuff. Can you talk a little bit about maybe, you know, there's a lot to talk about there. You don't have to go through each one, but maybe 
tell us about the podcast and the album that you did. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that or if there's any other of those that you'd really like to highlight. An interest in various historical topics, there's always like a, a kind of ebb and flow, right? And so um, uh, I think to a certain extent, there is there can be a there, there can be a sort of complacency about um, well this is an amazing collection undoubt you know without a doubt uh, researchers will come to us but I think that times have changed and um, and that the research community now expects you to sort of come to them and and that's a real fundamental shift in the way we think and uh, yeah as you mentioned um, we have the fellowship program we have um, we have a a, a film a film grant project where we we um, provide a, a a grant to a a filmmaker at residence who then creates a short edited program based on testimonies from the collection. Uh, we have a lot of events and conferences that we support that are designed to sort of lift up the collection in both the public eye but also uh, among the the research community. Uh, we have um, we've done our own productions based on the testimonies. So the podcast series is already in its third season. We're planning to do a fourth season. And, and this, this podcast series uh, is, is really just, again, like I said, we've always sort of embraced uh, uh, sort of new methods and new technologies. And this really just seemed like the ideal way uh, to, to, bring, uh, to bring audiovisual material to a new listenership, right? To, uh, to the non-research listenership. Um, I'm a I'm obviously a, a big fan of of podcasts, and um, and I'd been listening to a number of podcasts that uh, that were based on oral history collections. Mm. And there's one in particular that I I stumbled upon called "Making Making Gay History," which is uh, based on the oral oral histories of that Eric Marcus recorded with with leading figures in the LGBTQ mm. community. And you know, I. I don't know a lot about this topic. This is not my my an, an area that I know a lot about, and and I found it one of the most compelling hmm. um, compelling podcasts I've ever heard wow. based on these archival recordings. And I said, okay, well, we need to do we need to do, we should do something like this. And and so I asked Eric Marcus um, if he'd be willing to help produce uh, produce a series for us. And he also just happens to be a nice. Um, you know, Jewish boy from New York, and so he agreed and um, and found an, a team of of uh, of to support him. Uh, uh, another a co-producer, Nahani Rouse, um, and they've been producing edited edited versions of the testimonies in in, in podcast form now for three seasons with um, with quite uh, with quite a bit of success. Um, you know, That's over a hundred. Hundred thousand downloads and streams on Spotify, and 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 so these are these are listeners that would would probably never stumble into Aviary at an access site and use right. the collection that way. They might find some of our edited programs on our website or on YouTube, but but this is just another another way to to push these voices out into to the public. And that podcast for listeners is "Those Who Were There" is the name of that podcast, right? Yeah, "Those Who Were There," the latest. The, and, and they're all. If you go to our website um, or Google those who are there, you'll find you'll find it. Um, you can listen to it on the on the on, on the website as well as on um, on all your your pot, podcast apps. But um, the website has a lot of other additional information, including uh, episode notes for each episode that that are written by a um, a, a renowned scholar, um, Professor Sam Cassow, who provides additional context about each episode, which is really valuable in further readings, images that we've gotten from the families, scanned images from, from family archives. So it, it's a really, I think it's, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's a little strange because you're taking a video testimony and, and removing the video and making it into audio in order to do this. So it feels like you're, you're losing something obviously mm. in this, in this transformation, but you're also, but you also gain something because as you know, if you listen to podcasts, you know, when you're, when it's just you in the, in, in a pair of headphones and you're, um, you know, walking down the street, listening to a, a podcast, you just sort of disappear into, into your head and it's very intimate yeah. as well. So I think it's appropriate, although there is something lost and something gained. Um, and then you said you, the songs project. So that's, that's um, that's called songs from testimonies. It's also available on our our website. Um, 
And that's really a, uh, it really started as a kind of traditional research project. So um, one of our fellows, Sarah Garabova, discovered some really unusual songs that were sung in a testimony that we'd never heard before um, when, she was, when she was creating her critical edition. And, um, and we found the song so compelling that we asked a, a, a local ethnomusicologist um, in New York and um, a musician himself to come and perform the songs at a conference uh, as a sort of act of commemoration. Mm. And we were just blown away by the results and thought that we need to do, we need to do more of this. And so it became a, um, both an ethnomusicological research project, but also a performative project. So Zistel Slipovich is our musician in residence, and he is, um, and he's moved through the collection, find, uh, locating testimonies with song, um, sometimes fragmentary songs that were, you know, interwar songs, um, religious songs, um, songs that were written in ghettos and camps that may be very um, well known, but may also be completely unknown. And he's he's done the research, and then he's he's performed these songs. He's created his own notation or his own composition for each of the songs, and performed them. And we've recorded recorded them with his with an ensemble, and and, and they're now available um, for listening. So it and there's been concerts. We've performed the songs several times in concert um, with the context, showing excerpts from the testimonies. Where does the song come from? Explaining how the song emerges and the meaning of the lyrics. Um, and yeah, so it, it's a research project. It's a performance project. It's a commemorative project. It's also a really valuable learning um, learning tool. It's a way for for the general public to enter into a difficult topic, yeah, um, and learn a lot about learn a lot about testimony. So, so it's been a pretty rewarding a rewarding project. It's such a beautiful story. I love that, and um, and I also know. Uh, that you pressed it on vinyl as well, didn't you? Yeah, well, because I'm a I'm a music nerd, so this was <laughs> you know I wasn't well, and I mean also I'm an archivist, and and vinyl lasts a really long time. So um, my thought was that if we press it on vinyl, um, it will it will last a longer if we do it on CD. We also do it on CD, and it's available on all the streaming services as well. Um, but you know, it is a work of art. We had a local. Uh, a local little press artist, Jeff Muller, who runs um, Dexterity Press. He he printed each of the sleeves by hand. Wow! Um, and they were designed by uh, this incredible Belarusian um, artist, uh, Yulia Rudskaya, and she um, she did all the design work. She actually created a um, a uh, an animated film around one of the songs as well. Oh wow! Uh, there's more information. She was one of our Vlog fellows. It's on our website as well, the film filmmaker in residence fellowship. So um yeah, it's a it's a really it's a really interesting project. And I've learned a lot about the value of music as a historical source um through this through this effort. Yeah. Um but also the music itself is just it's quite beautiful. These are these are world class musicians doing, you know, performing these pieces. It's it's really something to to listen to. So I'd like to circle back to the discussion around the other Holocaust testimony archives and collections that exist out in the world. Um, to someone that's an outsider to the nitty gritty details of all that, and you gave us some good insights into what some of the variances and variables are there, but it would seem that as a naive user who is interested in researching Holocaust testimonies that I might be able to go to a single place and search across, um, you know, all of these various collections or at least a number of them. Uh, does that exist? Is that in the works? Is there discussions amongst uh, the various entities uh, that hold and manage collections? Well, what I would say to that naive researcher is there absolutely should be something like that, and it's a it is a shanda that there isn't. Um, and yeah, there are there are discussions about how to make that possible. And there have been some small attempts. Um, but at this point, um, uh, you know, I think my description as well of the different organizations and their different sort of policies around access uh, also point to the underlying problem here, which is that all of these organizations are, are unique individual organizations with policies and procedures and politics um, that 
can prevent them from you know, playing nicely with one another. Um, and I certainly, you know, I include the fortune of you, we're not any, any, I'm not excluding us from, from this. Right. Um, so it's not about the technology. The technology is, is very much there to make these, to, to make it possible for uh, a sort of single, a single search across, uh, across testimony collections that would reveal results for, for the research community. And I think it's an ab it absolutely has to be the next step. Mm. Um, and not just for the research community, but for the families. Um, one of the most infuriating things, I think, for uh, children and grandchildren of survivors is who, they don't know where their where their their grandparents' testimony is. Like, which archive is it in? Mm. They have no simple way to find it, and um, that seems to me to be a major disservice to the to the families of the survivors who who, at great emotional risk, gave us their testimony. So right. we really need to find a. We need to find a way to do that, and um, we need to work together as or across organizations to make that happen. Um, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum has also um, has also made some really in important inroads in this regard. They have uh, something called Collection Search, where they've added metadata from the USC Shoah Foundation, their metadata, and the Fortune of Video Archives metadata, since they have access to our collection on site at USHMM, into their Collection Search. So that's the first search engine I've seen where you can actually search across USHMM, USC, and, and Fortunoff and find, um, find testimonies that are related. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, we're, and we're also doing it in Aviary to a certain extent. So in Aviary, we've got a couple of different organizations um, with testimonies that have, have joined together to create what's called in Aviary a flock. And so it's, it's a way to search across. Um, it's like a portal that can search across different collections in Aviary. So we've got um, the Fortune of Video Archive, um, the Illinois Institute of Technology's David Boder mm. collection, which are some of the, which are the earliest audio recordings of extended audio recordings of survivors recorded in 1946, wow. um, and a number of other organizations that have have audio and video testimonies in Aviary, and you can search across those as a as a you know collective. And so there are there are plenty of examples of this working. We've also got a um, we 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 formed a a digital humanities project that brought together transcripts um, over a three, I think, three thousand testimony transcripts of survivor testimony from Fortunoff, US HMM, and USC yeah. Shoah Foundation, uh, in a project called Let Them Speak. And you can search across the transcripts of all those, um, all those collections. And that's pretty. That's also a step. Again, another example of what would be possible. Imagine a world in which everybody right. just finally shared their testimonies. It, it's so you know we have a lot of examples of how this works and the benefits of it, but um, you know we don't have like a we don't have. It's almost like we need an umbrella organization that would pull all of these disparate groups together and make them agree on how to how to share metadata in a way that everyone can have access to it. Right. We're not there yet. Yeah. Okay. So some glimmers of hope, but, but not quite there yet. Yeah. Switching gears. I want to ask a question. Uh, I recently had Bert Lyons uh, on the show and we talked about content authenticity. And um, <clears throat> I guess I wonder, I mean, this is an issue for every archive, but given you know, the focused efforts around Holocaust denial and things like that. I wonder how you're thinking about the prospect of um, fakes and forgeries in the age of AI when, you know, it's not a new issue. Fakes and forgeries have been issues for archives for as long as archives have been around. But, but just the ability and capability of people to create content now um, to support false narratives and 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 cause issues for archives like yourself, I wonder, is that something that's getting talked about within you know Holocaust testimony circles, or is is that still on the horizon? As technology improve or you know changes and um, is more sophisticated, and these AI tools become more sophisticated, um, yes, yeah, certainly there's that's a new risk, right? But there are also new tools to new technologies and tools to sort of identify things that are, you know, um, fake, right. right? So there's, there's the technology, um, brings with it new types of, new types of artifacts and ways to see how, you know, whether or not this is, you know, testing the authenticity of a, of a digital 
a digital object. I'm sure it's 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 that's way beyond my. I can't really talk about that because that's beyond my my field of expertise. But in in my area, I mean, really, that the more the more dangerous um, the more dangerous thing in, in, instead of like outright denial, um, which has always existed, but is really limited to the margins is um, something that you've seen more and more of, which is not outright denial, but a kind of um, half truth uh, or willful manipulation of the facts um, to sort of, it's like denial light. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's bad history um, being sort of marketed as authentic history in order to pursue a particular ideological or political end, right? Yeah. So you see this a lot in, in um, you know, not to pick on, not to pick on anyone in particular, but in certain regimes in in Europe that have been you know, considered more, um, have taken a sort of more populist authoritarian turn. There have been uh, quite obvious attempts to replace um, traditional independent scholarship with um, with scholars who are who are being um, sort of uh, controlled, funded, supported by, by the state and the government in a way um, and, and sort of asked to will, you know, willingly um, misrepresent the truth, right? So they still cite historical sources, but they cite them in a way that is, w- would not be, um, you know, a sort of a- attempted objective historical um, writing, right? Yeah. In order to, to 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 tell a story that is that is inaccurate, let's say right. you know um, that uh, Polish uh, Polish citizens um, were not complicit in um, in in the Holocaust, and you know every every Polish village um, was filled with with individuals who were um, willing to hide uh, and save Jews from extinction like see these types of um sort of exaggerations of of um and and misrepresentations of sources that's becoming a much greater threat than outright denial also because it's difficult because the way it's shaped it looks like scholarship right right. looks like research it's presented from official organizations that just happen to be corrupted um and so that becomes um it becomes much more of a difficult thing to to push back on, right? But you can, and and, and scholars do that. And that's exactly what's, what what good scholars do is they push back on this stuff. Um, but yeah, the AI, um, the, the in, considering this is an audio visual collection exclusively at the Fortune Fiori Archive, yeah, it's um, it seems pretty frightening. What is what is what would be possible, right? Um, when it seems it seems that. Well, well, first point well taken. I mean, it sounds like you know, let's not let's not focus too much on uh, the nitty gritty of AI at the sacrifice of recognizing the larger issues, which are much broader uh, than that. So I don't, I, I, I really hear what you say there and appreciate those comments. Um, I guess w- just one of the things that I think about. I mean, the kind of quick scenario you threw out was like uh, someone creates something fake. Um, and it, they're tools to identify things as fake. And that's true. I think what's gonna what's almost more worrisome for me, and I think that every archive will need to kind of arm themselves with, and there are technologies to do this, at least if not today, then on the near horizon, but is to be able to combat claims of things that are authentic, that are held within an archive, um, which people claim are fake and they have to prove that they're authentic, right? Like that, that is when, mm. when people start to cast doubt about authentic things being fake, that's almost more worrisome to me than someone creating something fake and having to prove that it's fake or saying that it's authentic. I yeah, think. absolutely. That And that's, that sort of reminds me of the same kind of, you know, bad history that I was trying to, to describe, like just, you know, these, these sort of willful manipulation of the sources that exist and, and claiming they're either inauthentic or um, or 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 sort of, or sort of rep- misrepresenting, misquoting them, or quoting them selectively in order to to make an argument that's that's unsound. 
I mean, that's absolutely true. That could that seems like a tactic that could be used. I mean, at the Fortune Off Video Archive, um, we can at least point to um, a chain of of uh, you know a provenance chain mm-hmm. that takes us all the way back to the to the original master recordings, which are still um, in cold storage at uh, uh, you know in New Haven, right? Yeah. So actually, I think they're they're in Hamden. Yeah. At our storage facility there, but um, <laughs> for those for those New Haven geography buffs, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't want anyone to. I mean, uh, it's not fair. It's in Hamden, um, but uh, yeah. So I mean, we we have a chain that we can then show the the sort of authentic steps that were taken, and even in the digitization process, there was great care given to um, the the sort of SAMA. SAMA systems document the whole digitization process. Mm-hmm. And so what's happening as the signal sort of changes over time. And so you you also have a pretty, you have like a record of of the actual transfer and you can show if there's been interruptions or not, lack of interruptions and yeah. things like that. So yeah. that's that's pretty detailed, um, well, a pretty detailed level of, of um, authenticity control. So Stephen, one of the things that I want to do with this podcast is to back up out of the weeds and reflect on why the work that we do is important to remind ourselves to rejuvenate on purpose and meaning of this work. Um, And with that in mind, I I wonder if you could reflect on the importance and the why behind the Fortune Off Video Archives work. Why is it important? Well, I think that... um... It's important for a couple of reasons. I'll I'll just give you I'll give you three. Um, well, first of all, the, the Holocaust is is quite possibly the greatest crime committed in the 20th century, and one of the greatest crimes in history. And and as such, the the brutality of the Holocaust has really impacted our society on 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 so many levels. For, so, from a kind of universal perspective. We're still very much living in a world that was was shaped by the impact of the Holocaust and the Second World War, and um, our belief in um, these ideas of universal human rights, et cetera, and of course our inability to always adequately support um, support uh, the regime of human rights internationally. Um, this is directly related to. Um, to the to the events of the Holocaust. And so if you really want to understand the world in which we're living today, you cannot do so without approaching the history of the Holocaust. And the history of the Holocaust needs to be approached by every generation in a new in a new way. So um, and having an archive such as this uh, is one of the best ways and working and engaging with an archive such as this is really one of the best ways to approach this this topic. It's also Im- important and the work we do is important because I think the archive is 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 something of a living memorial to to those who did not survive right so the survivors themselves are are really the anomalies they're the lucky ones um, and the vast majority of European jewry was murdered six million men women and children and so I, I really see this this archive as a, a sort of living memorial to um, both the the survivors and those who did not survive their families who did, did not make it and and so the archive can 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 serve as a as a as a bridge between the living us and and the dead and um and in fact as as we as time progresses and we're we're beginning to reach an era where um, there will no longer be any living witnesses of the holocaust um, due to just simply demographic um, change the the archives and archives like this one of testimonies of Holocaust survivors will only become that much more important. Uh, it will be the only way in which we can really engage with um, personal stories of of the witnesses. Um, only only diaries and memoirs and testimonies like this can 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 give us an access to what it felt like to be uh, to be there at uh, in the war in the camps in the ghettos. Um, and, and to have survived, and um, and then I think the work we do is important as first of all as an act of solidarity with the survivors and witnesses themselves, uh, uh, and and as an act of solidarity, it really solidarity it really has served as a a model, a model for what I would call an ethical and empathic approach to documenting 
uh, the history of mass violence uh, from the perspective of those those who were there, the witnesses, right? So a bottom up perspective, um, and and it has served as a model, uh, and it continues to serve as a model for lots of organizations who do who do the type of important work of of documenting human rights and civil rights abuses. So um, yeah, so those are those are just three ways I think that the collection. Um, collection really is a, uh, it continues to have a, a impact and is really an important, important, um, an important organization. Well, Stephen, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, it's been extraordinarily enlightening. I want to thank you for your work that you do. And um, it's just been an amazing, it's been amazing to hear about the journey of, of this incredible collection and archive. So thank you for sharing with us today. Um, in closing, I want to ask you a question uh, that I ask all of my guests on the Damn Right podcast, which is totally separate from anything we've talked about so far today, which is, what's the last song you added to your favorites playlist or liked? The last song I added to my, my playlist. Um, well, I guess I have to stay true to, uh, true to the archive and maybe not be entirely honest and say that one of the last songs I put on my playlist was from the volume three of our, our Songs from Testimonies project, which is called Shotmans or Shadows. Um, and it would, it would be the title track, um, Shotmans, uh, which is a Yiddish song. Uh, that's in my playlist. And I okay. hope you all listen to it too. Okay, we'll share the links to, to that in the show notes. Can you tell us what the actual last song you put in your playlist was? It's actually, I, you know, usually it's whole albums. I put whole albums in my playlist. Is a um, a Greek, a Greek um, avant-garde musician named Savina Yanato, okay. who I stumbled upon. Yeah, the song is called um, something in Greek, which I went well not. It, okay. You know, mispronounce for your audience. <laughs> I'll, I'll get the link from you so we can share it with everybody. Wonderful. All right. Well, Stephen, thank you sure. so much. Uh, you've been extremely generous with your time and all your insights. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time. No problem. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for listening to the Damn Right Podcast. If you have ideas on topics you want to hear about, people you'd like to hear interviewed, or events that you'd like to see covered, drop us a line at damnright at weareavp.com and let us know. We would love your feedback. Speaking of feedback, please give us a rating on your platform of choice. And while you're at it, make sure that you don't miss an episode by following or subscribing. You can also stay up to date with me and the Damn Right Podcast by following me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in slash C Lucinic. And finally, go and find some really amazing and free resources from the best damn consultants in the business at weareavp.com slash free hyphen resources. You'll find things like our damn strategy canvas, damn health scorecard, and the get your damn budget slide deck template. Each resource has a free accompanying guide to help you put it to use. So go and get them now.